Well, I, got, I went to go get a haircut on Tuesday because I started looking like a caveman. And I, that, you know, I gotta make sure my wife's okay with that. Um, and so I go to get my haircut around 2.30. Uh, I had a break during work here and I have a long day on Tuesday, so I, I wanted to squeeze it in. School was uh, not out yet, so that's great. Um, so I was like, let me get there. And when I got there, there was no one there except for me and the two hairstylists. And I'm like, yes, good. So I'm in there and, uh, and I'm kind of in a hurry, you know, and the, the one that receives me is going to cut my hair. She has really bright red hair. And so what does any other normal person do when someone has really bright uh, red hair? You talk about it, right? Well, I did. No, <laughs> not everyone does, but I did. I said, uh, you know, first of all, I'd like to have you cut my hair. She's like, sure. And so we're sitting down and, and she starts to talk to me what I want to do. And I'm like, you know, um, you know, you know what to do. Like, you got it. My system, my 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 order is in their little receipt system of what I get. Anyway, so I'm hanging out with her, and um, and I was really in a hurry. I wasn't really there to do ministry. I'm just being I'm being honest with you. Is it okay if I'm not perfect for a second? I'm being transparent with you. I I wasn't thinking so all may know. I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, because I was in a hurried state, and I so. But I sat down and said, "So, um, what's the special occasion? Like, is there, is there some kind of holiday? Because you know, St. Patrick's Day is coming up, so I thought it'd be green, the green hair." And she's like, "No, I'm getting married. I'm wearing red hair for my wedding in May." And when she said the word wedding, the Holy Spirit stopped me in my hurried state and said, "It's time." Why? Because I'm a pastor. And I officiate weddings. And God stopped me from thinking about how I need to get back here and get ready for young adult group and stuff. And it's time. And so I said, all right, God, um, in, my, in my heart and in my head, I'm like, God, lead me. Tell me what to do. Help me. And so I began to share with her uh, what I do. Because I was like, oh, I do weddings. I'm a pastor. Where do you go to church? I go to Calvary. I'm pastor at Calvary. Oh, I know that place. Um, she's like, I was like, so where's your wedding? And she said, well, I'm not religious, not really the religious type person, but I'm, I'm having my wedding at a church where my grandmother raised me. I said, oh, that's cool. I'm not religious either. <laughs> I said, you know, unfortunately the world has kind of hurt that, that, that term because religion tends to be I have to do these things because of God or for God. I told her though, and I explained that to her. I said, I have a relationship with God because of what he's done for me. I just want you to know that when you go out to help share Jesus and the love of God with people, a lot of it's gonna be correcting bad perceptions of church and Christianity. A lot of it's gonna be repainting true doctrine, true teaching of the word, and helping fix all the bad teaching that they've heard and all the bad assumptions or perceptions they have because of sometimes our mistake. And so I took the time to go, you know, it's not about religion, it's about a relationship with God because what he's done for me, I serve him and I love him. And so she's like, oh, that, that's, that, I like that, you know? And then I was like, you know, we have a play coming up called Convinced. And this play is basically to help people that have questions that need, that need answers. And I would love to have you come out. And all of a sudden the other hairstylist was like, oh, Someone was in here yesterday talking about that. And I was really proud of our church all of a sudden. You know what I mean? I was like, yes, you guys are out there doing it. Thank you. I appreciate that. You guys are out there talking about the play, inviting people to come. This girl ends up being a Christian that goes to Southside. She's in the youth group. She's heavily involved there. And so she, so here's what's neat is here. She's, she's listening to us. And so now I'm teaching her how to evangelize, how to share the gospel. I had no idea she was a believer. I was hoping she was listening, just in case she wasn't. She's a believer. She's a follower of Christ. She's hearing what I have to say, too. And I was able to even show her, how do you bring up Jesus while getting a haircut? Isn't that cool? And thank you for passing out postcards and inviting people to the play, because it's working. Thank you for that. Look, this was my well for the day. I want to go to John chapter 4 because Jesus meets people at everyday places to share what he has to offer. And for me today, that day on Tuesday, it was my, my barber shop. I don't know what to call it. Salon. Salon. Thank you. 
A saloon, no, chicken. <laughs> With my pistols, no. John chapter four. I told the first service, we're gonna do a Bible study here instead of me reading the scripture and then telling you things. I'm gonna break things down as we go. Sound good? A little Bible study. John chapter four, verse one. I'm using the New Living Translation. <clears throat> Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan, Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. It's interesting, isn't it? Even Jesus gets tired, right? It's because he took on the form of a man, not just God. He was fully man, fully God. He was also dependent on the Holy Spirit. Jesus depended on the Holy Spirit. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. When he was water baptized, the Spirit came upon him, and the dove was above his head, and it was anointing him for ministry. It wasn't until Jesus was baptized that then he went out and started to preach the gospel to everyone around. So even Jesus was used by the Spirit and was using the Spirit in a perfect fellowship with him because of the Trinity. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. So he was also thirsty. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to who you are speaking to. He would ask me and I would give you living water. If only our community knew who we have in our hearts. If only our community knew who we come here to worship and what he offers. If only our world knew who Jesus is and what he has. Wow. What she's looking for is standing right in front of him. What she's looking for, you'll find out why. Verse 11, but sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoy, what his animals enjoyed? And Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water that I'll never be thirsty again and I won't have to come here to get water. Stop right there. So Jesus is talking to her and she's not getting it that he's talking about himself and that if you believe in me, if you receive me, you will find true satisfaction in this world and in the next. You know what we have to do as, as believers in Christ? We have to help people think about their spiritual destiny. We have to think about helping people think about their eternal needs. She was stuck on this physical blessing that she wasn't getting it. It wasn't clicking for her what Jesus was talking about. So Jesus had to get real all of a sudden. And he had a word of knowledge for her. He understood. She, he knew something that only she would know. So he has this knowledge from him, his father, to give him an insight into her life. And this is what it says. He says, go and get your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. She said, you're right. Or he, Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband for you've had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You, you certainly spoke the truth. She says, sir, the, the woman said, you must be a prophet. Wow. So Jesus has this knowledge about her life and he gets that to help her see who he is. Spiritual need, not just a physical need. You guys may not realize what happens here on Sundays, but last week something beautiful happened because I, I run the Next Steps group when I'm not preaching and a, a young lady in our group who, has, who was a Muslim who gave her life to Christ she had a vision of Jesus. She had an experience with Jesus. And she saw a light and she saw the cross. And when she woke up, she just started reading her Bible. And she was reading the scripture. But she was in class last week and she was sharing how, you know, the Muslims sometimes struggle, the, the converts struggle with whether what I do, uh, if it's enough for God. 
A lot of people struggle with, do I do enough for God? Am I this or that? And, you know, they're believing a different God than our God anyway. So she's struggling whether God really loves her too. Well, what we don't realize is we came into the 11 o'clock service. Uh, Rachel read the exact same scripture during worship that we read to her in our class. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. It is by grace through faith you have been saved, not by works so that no man can boast. It was not, it's not because of her works that she's okay. It's because of the work of the cross and what Jesus did that makes her okay. Well, she comes in to hear that, to affirm her faith and to affirm what we already said in there. But then Rachel goes further. Our worship pastor goes further and says, I just feel like I need to share that God loves you and that you need to know that God loves you. And it was burning in Rachel's chest and she had to say it. And it's because that was for her. See, that's a knowledge. That's a word of knowledge that Rachel had and she had no idea who it was for, but it was for someone in this room. It's probably for more than, more than one. But see, I got to sit back and just revel in God's power and glory because I know exactly who that was for. Because it was exactly what we said to her. We said, God loves you. You won't understand it. You don't get it, but God loves you. Because it's not what we do that makes him love us. It's what he already did for us that causes him to love us. He first loved us. So you have this woman getting wrecked by Jesus. She's having to see spiritually instead of just physically. And this is what's really cool what happens next in verse 25. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. So he was able to share the truth of who he is. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman because that wasn't normal back then to be in public talking to the woman wasn't part of their culture. But none of them, and by the way, they were alone at this time too, but none of them had had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her or why are you talking to her? Maybe it was her reputation. She had many husbands and they're not together anymore. The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Wow, isn't that awesome? She has an encounter and experience with Jesus. She leaves her water jar to the side and just goes and tells everyone to come see Jesus. That's exactly what evangelism is. That's exactly what it means to go and share the good news. That's what evangelism means. To go and tell is simply to have an experience with Jesus, your own experience today, your experience of salvation, and then go share what you've encountered and experienced with those around you. She just showed us how to do it. Because she had that experience, she was able to go and tell people, come see this guy. And that's exactly what we do with an unbeliever, is we say, hey, come see Jesus. Come meet him. At least try reading the scriptures. Come hang out with me for coffee. Let me share with you what I've been learning and and receiving. It's changed my life. Her story turned into a village coming to know Jesus. We're going to find out in a second. But check this out. We're going to read on. Meanwhile, the disciples, verse 31, were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone? The disciples asked each other. So even us believers, sometimes we're not in the right zone, are we? Sometimes we're thinking physical all the time, but not spiritual, right? What's happening is, is Jesus was so consumed with reaching people that he didn't need lunch. He wanted her to know Jesus. He wanted her to know himself. He wanted her to know what truly satisfies the living water that would never run out. You know, what if what's going on is this woman is trying to find significance in a human relationship with a man instead of the relationship with God. And he's saying, you're going to constantly be hungry and never satisfied with relationships in man, especially men. You'll never find true satisfaction in your earthly relationship until you have a heavenly relationship with your father. And that's exactly our situation in this world. People have no idea how desperate they are for help. They have no idea that they're going to continue to chase the junk in their lives until they meet our Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ. 
And it's our job to stop, interrupt a little bit of their day and say what you're really looking for is not here on earth in the sense of these physical things, but it's in Jesus Christ. Anyone here with me today? Amen. I see it. I hear it. Praise God. Jesus has this burden for souls so much that he goes on to say in verse 34, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God. What's the will of God? So that all may know Jesus, the love of God, to share it, to preach it. My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. Wow, how cool is that to be a part of bringing people to eternal life, not just bringing them to Panera's? Like, like you hang out at Panera to bring someone to eternal life. How cool is that? Just think about that for a second. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying that one plants and another harvest, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get it to gather the harvest. Think about that for a second. Some of us maybe have the privilege of harvesting that person. Do not take credit for that because we don't save people. All we do is share Jesus, the lifesaver. Okay? Some other people have already planted and they might go to a different church and get saved. Let's celebrate. Thank you, Jesus. Let's not be bitter about souls being saved. Right? Hopefully it's true salvation, right? But listen, there's some of us who will plant, some of us who will water, but God gives the increase. And we have to also do the harvesting. We have a lot of responsibility, but it's, it's not actually that hard because we don't have to change the heart. God does that. We just have to give them the, the direction of where to go to find that change, that changed heart. He's excited to get to work in, on this lady's life because he knows it's going to change that whole town, it looks like. Not that she has a big mouth or anything, but she was just really excited, Right? And look at verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village. By the way, I don't care if someone has a big mouth if it's talking about Jesus. That's great. You know what I mean? I mean, it should be tacked to it, but she, she's just excited. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because, the woman, because of what the woman had said. He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days. Wow. It wasn't just a one-hit wonder, was it? Jesus hung out and made sure he just continued to teach and pour into these people. So your time with people is not going to be always just one time. There's actually going to be people that you're supposed to build a relationship with. They begged him to stay in their village. He stayed two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. All of this happened because Jesus was thirsty. I need a haircut. I don't know what God's going to do with that seed, but Jesus did what he did and it turned into an entire field. Do not count out your interaction at Wawa or your interaction at the DMV because God's going to take it and turn it into a field, a harvested field of souls going to eternal life. You have no, listen, when we reach one person, we're possibly reaching that entire family in their line. We've all been, we're all beneficiaries of our grandmothers and grandfathers praying and going to the Father for us, and now we're saved. You know what I mean? Thank you, God. Thank you, grandparents. I say that because I hear a lot of times it's grandparents. <laughs> wow. So all may know. Jesus has an encounter. We have an encounter with Jesus, uh, with this woman at the well. We have an encounter with Jesus. That is our basic motivation to leave here today. And share what God has done in our lives. We overcomplicate it. And we'll get more into that as the series goes on. I want to share with you the gospel though. What is the gospel? Because I've said it a couple of times. Because the gospel met her, met the woman at the well. And we know the gospel is the good news. But I want you to understand this. I even have it in writing for you so that you can study it. 
understand it and even communicate it in layman's terms if needed to those around you. And I only use scripture really for the entire thing, like 98% of it. You ready? Now listen, while I read this, I'm believing that the gospel is going to do work on people's hearts in this room. And if you get a little excited, it's all good. The Bible says, for everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And the wages of sin is death. But when we were utterly helpless, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ the Lord has done for us. There is now no condemnation for those who belong in Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Amen. Amen. Praise you, God. Praise God. That's the gospel. The gospel is sinners. Women at the well who have had six husbands can come and be accepted and loved by Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And they'll be made a new creation. Doesn't mean, so when Jesus loves and accepts you, he doesn't keep you the way you are. Just make sure we understand that. You have to tell your friends this. You have to tell the people you're ministering to. He's not saying, I accept your sin as okay. No, 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 no. He's saying, I came to destroy the work of sin and Satan because it's ruining your life and will ruin your destiny to be with me in eternity. I've come to make you a new person if you would believe in what I've offered you and you will be a new creation. Even when you don't think you can do something different in your life, even when you don't think you can stop sinning, I have given you the power to stop sinning. I've given you the freedom of, of being broken from the slavery of sin. I've given you freedom from the slavery of sin. This is what Jesus is offering. Let me tell you something, guys. That's too good not to share. This is too good not to share. And the gospel doesn't stop there. Jesus said he came to bind up the brokenhearted, to give sight to the blind, to heal the sick and the lame, to set the captives free. He came to destroy the works of the devil, and he came to give life and life to the fullest, an abundant, satisfying life. I'm reading to you scripture. I'm telling you what the Bible says. This is the gospel. And it would be wrong of us for people not to know. It would be a sin for us not to share this good news. But here's what's beautiful about it. We're not sharing it from a textbook. We're sharing it from experience. Like we have experienced it. We have been set free, right? Amen? I'm like, we got to believe that, right? Anyone, anyone like literally physically thirsty right now? Like you're, you're parched, you need water. Would you be willing to join me on stage, though, at the same time? Anyone not want to do an illustration? Anyone? Come on up. Teenagers, kids, youth, young adults, yeah, come on up. Come on, ladies. All right, ladies are brave today. Oh, here we go. We got, we got John to represent. Okay. Just line up right here and face the audience. You can stand in my way, like right here. Face the audience. Thanks, man. Thank you. Imagine you're out at a restaurant or you're out in the public at a park. I don't know what context. What's your well? Where do you live at? Where do you go? Chick-fil-A? I know I do. All right. Who doesn't? That's Jesus' chicken. (laughs) Especially the Camden one. Especially that Camden. Sorry, other Chick-fil-A's. I just, that's I love Chick-fil-A Camden. You're thirsty. But not just thirsty physically. Maybe, okay, and I'm, I'm not trying to say anything, although first service, 
I brought up someone and it ended up being that he needed this message and he was crying on stage in front of everyone. So I don't want to count that out. Come on up. Yeah, come on up. (laughs) Awesome. That makes it even harder to do this, what I'm about to do. Listen, you represent people today that are looking for something that they can only find in God. Wholeness, healing, forgiveness, truth, hope. And I, I don't mean just like temporary. I mean lasting, eternal. Everlasting hope. Now imagine I have water, but I give you none. Because, you know, there's only so much. Can I share with you, and you guys look that way, don't look, don't look behind you. Okay, even you little ones down there. Keep her, yeah. Can I show you what we walk around with? But for some reason, we're not giving it out. I got plenty to give away. I was in my house recently and I was worshiping God. And I said, God, I want more of you. And I'm worshiping, and all of a sudden I felt convicted. I'm like, was there something wrong with worshiping you, God? You know? (laughs) Now, he was like, he whispered in my heart, Ryan, you got plenty of me, but people out there don't even have a drop. People don't have a drop. You need to get out there. You need to get haircuts. You need to go to Panera. You need to go to Chick-fil-A. You need to go to the park, and you need to start talking about what I do and what I offer. You have enough of me. You need me, but you have plenty to spare. Come back to me, but you have to get back out there and give it away. You have way too much. You have too much hope, too much truth, too much love, too much grace, healing, and hope to be sitting in here and constantly asking me every day for more of you when people don't even have a drop or a sip of me. It's true though, isn't it? We're walking around like living wells of Jesus Christ with no bucket or rope to help people out. The gospel is the bucket and rope to drop down into that well of your life and to pull out the good news of Jesus Christ to the people all around us. And we got to get over our fears. That's next week. I better be careful. It's time. I'm going to encourage you next week that you can do this more than you realize. Listen especially those two little ones over there. Physically, they may be thirsty, but they represent children in our world who will experience flames if we don't get out there. We experience, we got to get out there. Would you help them get some water? Now, I'd be messed up if I didn't give you guys water, so come on over, grab some water. You said you were thirsty. Okay, here's some water. Thank you for coming up here. That was it. I mean, that you guys get a... An Emmy? Is that what it is? Is that the right award? Yeah. Thank you so much. We do have water for you. (laughs) Praise God. Give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you. That gets us to our final part of this message, the takeaways I'll have for you. Number one, the gospel is too good not to share. The gospel is too good not to share. That joy, that peace, that love that we've encountered, that's what makes me even want to leave my home and share my faith. That makes me go to the, by the way, the Holy Spirit had to wake me up at the the, um, salon, right? Because sometimes we're not thinking spiritually, we're thinking physically. We're not thinking eternally. What burdens me is, Jesus gave his life for all. This is 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 5. He gave his life for all. So wouldn't that mean that everyone has the right to know? That means everyone has the right to know. It would be like every single one of us having a key to eternal life, an extra one, because we have one for ourselves as Christians, and then we have another key. We have, in this world, maybe six billion keys between all of us to give out because maybe there's more than six or seven billion people in this world. It'd be like having seven billion keys and giving none of them out to eternal life. The key to eternal life is Jesus Christ. Yes, are we going to run into people who don't listen? Yes. 
I get that. But it shouldn't stop us from sharing to the ones that do, like the woman at the well. If anyone wasn't going to listen to Jesus, it would be her, right? But someone had planted seeds before because she already knew that the Messiah was coming. See, someone did the work before that. Someone did the work. And Jesus harvested it. It's the same thing with us. People have been doing the work. Grandparents have been praying. We've been doing the work. This play is going to do some work. In fact, how about we cultivate and plant the seeds, and then at the play, we'll help you harvest a bunch of souls at the Easter play. Because we're going to pray for them and invite them out to this play. Number two, our world is dying to know what Jesus died to give away. Our world is dying to know what Jesus died to give away. And number three, we are God's greatest means for sharing the gospel. We are God's greatest means for sharing the gospel. The reason why, again, is because we're not a textbook. We're a living testimony of what Jesus can do. We're a living testimony. Just think about this for a second. A tree or a rock can't express joy or emotion can it? But a human life can. Because God intended that we would be his greatest means for sharing the gospel. Not a tree, not a fish. Although it's a beautiful creation and because people can see it, they believe in God. That's awesome. But he has given us a mouth, hands and feet and legs to share. He has changed our hearts so we could be the greatest testimony of his gospel to those around us. Amen. Last week and this whole past year, God's been doing something in this place and in your lives. And I believe it's also because you're hanging out with God during the week, not just on Sunday. You're not waiting until Sunday to get your dose. You've been filling up on God all week. That's why we're experiencing a move of God in here. And if you don't, if you, if you need to work on that, do that. We're going to continue to experience a move of God. But last week, after that service, I saw so many people go online and share what God was doing. Thank you. Thank you for the mom who wrote a blog about her experience at, with, with her weekend with God and with Christians. Wow. Thank you for going online on Facebook. That's the beginning. Of course, we need to do it in person, but thank you for going online and sharing what God is doing. That's what we mean. It's out of the overflow that we do that. So we have a task, two tasks. One action step is share your experience with God this week. And if that means you need to have some experiences with God, then have the experience with God. Not just here. Go share it. Share online what God is doing. Share in person what God is doing in your life or in your church or this play coming up. And then the other action step, and by the way, I'm not gonna limit to you on how you should share that. You do whatever God leads you to do. And then the other action step is to take this card home and even starting now, if you want, writing names of people you want to pray for and invite to church for the, for the convinced play. Maybe someone who's really open to Jesus already, put them on this card, pray for them. Maybe put this on your dashboard, put it on your refrigerator. Don't cover up your gas tank gauge. Don't, don't cover that up. But put this on there to pray. Maybe someone who's really difficult, put that name on there. Maybe someone who's almost there, put that on there. And begin to pray for these names because God has to do a work in their lives even before they see the play. And maybe even pray for yourself that you'll be ready to handle what's coming. Because if you invest in people, they're going to need you to explain things. Okay? Okay. And here's the deal. We heard that some people were leaving these as if they were prayer requests. They're not. Take these with you and pray. And pray. This play, we've written it in, in the hopes of bringing unsaved, unbelieving, unchurched people to Christ. So we want you to come, but we really want you to try to bring people with you that don't know Jesus. 
convinced is about a play where someone isn't too convinced that God is real or true or what Jesus did is real or true. And so they go through this journey of giving him evidence and encouraging him to believe in faith and in facts what we have to offer. So we're going to be actually giving legit apologetic defense or facts about Jesus, truth about Jesus, creation, all these things. We're going to unpack this stuff. Now, we can't do it all in one play, but we have set it up where the Easter play ties in with this conversation between two gentlemen and this one gentleman sharing his faith with this other guy. And then we go in and out of the Easter play. It's going to be powerful. So it's modern day and biblical times around the life of Jesus. You need to bring your family and friends that don't know Jesus. It's going to be powerful. Would you close your eyes, bow your heads for a moment, because we also want to offer those today who said, I don't have that eternal well, Jesus Christ. I've been chasing things in this world and didn't realize that who I really needed was Jesus. If that's you today and you're saying, I recognize that I need Jesus, raise your hand for me. Awesome. For some of you, it may be a recommitment. For some of you, it may be first time. Just real quick, something important. If you are giving your life to Christ for the first time, there's a blue card in the pews for you to fill out because we want to help you go across that line and the journey beyond. And for those of you who have recommitted in your life, same thing if you want encouragement or a book to help you. Thank you. Awesome. If you're in this room tonight or today as, as a believer and you've been depending on the things of this world too much, today was a reminder that Jesus is all that you ever need. And I pray today that he reminds you of the goodness of his love and mercy and hope and truth so you'll go and share it as you leave this room. Amen. God, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you, God. And for those who are committing their lives to Christ right now, you can look on the screen and pray that prayer from your heart. Not a formula, but from your heart. God, we thank you for what you're doing in this room. We thank you, God, that we have the first step to going out and sharing the good news. We've experienced the good news. We've experienced your love. God, I pray we would take our experience and let it be a living testimony for all those to know your love and to follow Jesus. Help us as we go out into this community this week. Help us to seize opportunities that are right in front of us at our modern day wells. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.